Thanks for tuning in to our CS292 podcast summary of the book, Where Wizards Stay Up Late, by Katie Hafner and Matthew Lyon. My name is Chris Belandi. My name is Bing Chen. This book provides detailed insight into the origins of the Internet as a networking project at the Department of Defense called ARPANET. Before discussing ARPANET and its role in developing the Internet as we know it today, it's important to first ask the question, what exactly is ARPA and what does it have to do with computers? ARPA stands for the Advanced Research Projects Agency and is a division of the U.S. Department of Defense. It was founded in 1957 by President Eisenhower in response to the Soviet launching of Sputnik. Bob Taylor was one of the first directors of the Information Processing Techniques Office, or IPTO, one of ARPA's primary divisions. Frustrated by the communication difficulties presented by ARPA's disparate computer terminals, he proposed a networking project to ARPA director Charles Hersfeld that would connect ARPA's machines to each other and to ARPA's various research sites throughout the country. Taylor received a one million budget for the project and promptly hired Larry Roberts as his program manager. Two scientists, Paul Barry and Donald Davis, had already provided a theoretical basis for the network's key architecture, packet switching. Another member of Taylor's team, Wes Clark, had outlined another revolutionary strategy, placing a small computer between each host computer and the network. This would lessen the demand on host computers and provide ARPA direct control over the network's operation. These small computers became known as Intermediate Message Processors, or IMPs. After a request for proposals, in December 1968, Roberts awarded the contract to a small consulting company out of Cambridge, Massachusetts called Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, or BBN. Rivaling the amount of advanced research that was conducted at top institutions like Harvard and MIT, the company was nicknamed the Third University of Cambridge. We'll discuss a, sh uh, we'll discuss a detail of the IMP's construction after this short break. Uh, break time. Now let me introduce a, a fun fact. The at sign was inserted into email address by BBN employee Ray Tom Linson in 1972 as a way to separate a username from its corresponding machine name. After eight months of design, construction, and debugging, the first IMP was sent to UCLA shortly before the Labor Day in 1969. Graduate students at UCLA faced the task of design protocols for host-to-host -host communications. Collaborating with students at other IMP sites, Stanford, St. Barbara, and Utah, the group became known as the Network work Working Group. The Network Working Group developed the first major application for the network, Telnet, which handled remote logins. Shortly thereafter, the next IMP was installed at BBN's Cambridge office in March 1970, and this site became the central monitoring station for the entire network. BBN's workers were able to recognize and diagnose problems from their home office and direct their repairs remotely. They were even able to detect errors along the communication lines before AT&T, who actually owned the lines themselves. After the addition of FTP to the network growing functionality, AirPods saw the need to increase the network load. The International Conference on Computer Communication, held at the Washington Hilt, was a great success and demonstrated the entire computing world the viability of the packeting, switching, and the network's functionality. By 1973, the growing fad among, among users was personal message communication, which became known as network mail. In fact, an ARPA study at that time found that these messages comprised 75% 75, 75 of all network traffic. This phenomenon served as the precursor to what we know today as email. We'll take a short break before we describe some drawbacks to ARPANET's rapid growth, as well as its eventual disappearance that paved the way for the modern Internet. Break time again. Now let me introduce another fun fact. The first emotion was created on April the 12th, 1979 by Kevin. The symbol was used to convey that a particular message was meant to be a tongue-in-cheek. So as we were starting to discuss, ARPANET and specifically emails popularity also became the source of controversy. Issues of privacy, free speech, and private use of a taxpayer-funded project were fervently debated, both in network mailing lists and in congressional hearings. Nonetheless, by the end of the 70s, private, private companies had started selling commercially available email software, and even presidential candidate Jimmy Carter used email several times a day in his 1976 campaign. Following the emergency of a smaller regional network in, in the 80s, ARPA saw the need to in interconnect them into a single concatenated network. Engineers developed an idea for 
for a gateway a routing computer that would be placed between the various networks and handle the transmission of messages between them this created the need for a more independent host to host protocol that would become known as transmission control protocol or TCP TCP would act as an addressed envelope for packets and would be read by the gateway machines a later development internet protocol or IP would take over the routing responsibilities and let TCP control the movement of the data itself this combination standard known as TCP IP would become the basic framework for the internet that we use today by this time the secret of our planet had got out we searched the other fields and computer departments at the university with our APA contracts called for access and proposed a new cheaper network that would be supported by NSA this became known as CSNet Smaller networks like CSNet grew tremendously during the 80s, and by the end of the decade, ARPA knew that its creation was no longer needed. In 1989, the ARPANET plug was pulled. NSFNet, the successor of the aforementioned CSNet, and the many other regional networks in the U.S. would form the backbone of the new ARPA-less Internet. Thank you again for checking out our podcast summary of Where We the Stand Up Late. We hope you enjoy watching and learn a little something along the way. Until next time, I'm Bing Chen. And I'm Chris Bellini. Mm-hmm.